Verse 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what we were focusing on yesterday, the revelation of who Jesus is. And I, I, I do firmly believe, even after going through what we saw yesterday, that Revelation 10... If it's not Jesus directly, it's one of his chief angels who comes down and says, Jesus is coming. But I believe that it is Jesus. Verse 13, for you've heard of my conversation in the time past in the Jews religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, profited in the Jews religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father's and I'm sure that probably a lot of you at one time despised Bible Christianity. You hated it, tried to destroy it, tried to tear it down. And if it's a religion of men, it should be torn down. But then God did with you what he did with Paul. In verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace... To reveal his son in me. And so it's not just the Apostle Paul that Jesus is revealed in. He is revealed in each and every one of us who believe his word, who are trusting in his word, and who are called by that word. So we're looking at this doctrine, this teaching of the inner man and what that is. Ephesians 3 is where we're going next. Ephesians chapter 3. Um, and I may have touched on this last week, but I'm going to kind of pick it up from there. Uh, Ephesians 3, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with you, strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So when we talk about the strength that God has given to us, we are not strong. We are not strong people. We're not strong willed in that. We just, we put everything we, that we are into Christianity. It is God who is strong in us. And that's what Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, that's what Paul was made to understand because when he, when he wanted to be strong, he found out that he wasn't. And he realized that he was given in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12, um, he, there was given to him a messenger of Satan to buffet him. I know that messenger. Maybe different with me than it is with you, but each one of you have been, had a devil dispatched to you. A messenger of Satan. Satan grabs a devil and he says, see that Mike Hoggard? You pound on him. You try to get him to fall. You trip him. You lay stumbling blocks in front of him. And you make him about as low as you can possibly bring him. Because we have to destroy Mike Hoggard. But it's not just me. We have to destroy Carmen. We have to destroy Kevin. We have to destroy Hyun Mi. Have to destroy Will and his family, and and Philip and Gary and Todd and Sterling and Lori. We have to destroy these people because they're reading the Bible and they're believing it, and they're going to promote it. They're going to tell somebody else to read the Bible. They're going to give somebody else the scriptures, and we have to stop that. We have to destroy them from the earliest age possible. The devil loves your children. He loves them enough that he wants to destroy them. He wants to go after them at the youngest age possible. And that's what he did. He did it with me. He's done it with a bunch of you people. Some of you, I know your story. I know what's happened to you in your past. I know where you came from. And that's what Satan sent a devil or a group of them 
to do to you, to put a thorn in your flesh and say, we're going to destroy you, we're going to terrorize you, we're going we're to make evil people out of you. And God, and you said, God, take that out of me. Get this thorn away from me. I, that doesn't belong here. I don't want it because it keeps me from serving you. It keeps me from, from, from living for you and doing right. And so that Paul said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So... God did not pick you because you were strong. Yeah, I've watched you. I watched, I was watching your face a while ago. While I was talking about how the devil sent a devil after you at the youngest age possible. And I don't know you and I don't know your life. I don't know what happened to you, but I could see it resonate in you. You were thinking of your life. You were thinking of your past and everything that you've done in your past. Okay, and you ask God, God, take this away from me. Get it out of me. I don't want it anymore. Okay? And God said, well, how about if I just give you grace? Has he done that? Absolutely. So you don't need to know the story. You don't need to know the details. But I know people. I know Christian people. And the ones who are honest will say that thorn is still there. But God's given me grace. Amen. So we have then his spirit working in the inner man. God took you and he planted something in you. He put, uh, he put his word. Turn to, uh, turn to Jeremiah 32. Let's see, Did I, I said Jeremiah 32, but let's see. Yeah, it's there. That's what I want. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, I could have said, turn to the 777th chapter of the Bible, and you would have went, oh, I know what that is, Jeremiah 32. So, and when I, that's what I told, um, that's what I told Donna, the software lady. So write me up some software that if people think of a number, they can click on a few things and go right to that chapter and see what's there. So you can use the Pure Bible Search software and go to the 777th chapter and it'll take you right to Jeremiah 32. Because Jer we talked about the book yesterday, the one in God's right hand, the one then that Jesus takes and he's going to loose the seals. So in Jeremiah 32, Verse 6, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shal Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Now you've got to understand, Jeremiah, at this present time, is in prison. He was imprisoned for saying, Thus saith the Lord. And so, now God's going to use Jeremiah... To do something for him. So Hanamiel, verse 8, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord. And said unto me, by my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine, buy it for thyself. Then I knew this, this was the word of the Lord, because he's like, I'm in prison. You want me to buy something? So I bought the field of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even how many shekels of silver? What did I tell you yesterday about that number? There are 17 things that cannot separate us from the love of God. They spoke 17 languages at Pentecost. I counted them. 17 of them. Okay, what is that? And there was a transformation. God was taking these people and he was giving them his word in the language of the people. All right? Because that, that's God's plan. Is to give them his word, not just in Greek and not just in Hebrew, but in the language that they spoke. So, you know, Abram converted to Abraham, Sarah to, or Sarai to Sarah. And there you have 17 shekels of silver. So I subscribed the evidence and sealed it, took witnesses, weighed in the money and the balances, 
So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open. Remember what I said yesterday. Revelation is not sealed. Revelation is the book that God wants everybody to understand what it means. And so when you read Revelation, guess what? You don't have to say, I don't understand this. Just believe exactly what it says. Because I do think Revelation is written in plain language that that exact thing is going to happen. I think that beast does have seven heads and he does have ten horns. Now there's symbolism behind that, but I think it's literal. I think it's absolutely exactly how it's going to end up looking. That's going to be weird, but I think that's how it's going to happen. But then we, and that's the 27th book of the New Testament. 27th book of the Old Testament is Daniel. Daniel's sealed. You read Daniel and you're going, I don't, I don't understand it. Because there is a copy of this, of this purchase that he's making. He wrote out the, the details of the land and the purchase. One of them was sealed. So who has something important you value, like a title or something like that, in a lockbox somewhere? Now you might have a copy of it where you can use it. Your birth certificate comes in two forms. There is a sealed version of it in a county clerk's office somewhere where you were born. And they keep that record for perpetuity. For as long as this earth survives, the record of your birth is going to be in that one place. But then you can get a copy of it, a certified copy of it, with a seal on it that says, this is my birth certificate, this is who I am. So in that same arena, you have a, a sealed and an unsealed copy. Does it make sense? Okay. And it's for a purpose. And it's a book. Remember what we was talking about yesterday? The book, the book, the book. It's all about the book. And you have that book right here. The evidence of it. So he said, uh, verse 14, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed, and this evidence which is open, and put them where? Earthen vessel. And the Apostle Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So where is it? It's in you. And it's in you. And it's in you and you and me and all y'all. It's right there. And God says, I trust you with this treasure. Because I know there's something that you will and will not do. What you will do is you will keep it for all of your life. What you will not do is change it. You'll leave it exactly the way I gave it to you. Amen? For a time to come. So I'm going to give you a thorn in your flesh. Then I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to plant it in you. And by the way, this thing, this book, is my son. And he is the inner man that is in you. That causes you to be who you really are. Which is, I believe, every word of God. Amen? So, verse 17 Back in Ephesians 3, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. There it is. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Christ dwells in my heart. The inner man is in my heart by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height. Four things. And to know the love of Christ, which, is, which passeth knowledge. And it does. Because when you comprehend how much God loves you, it, you don't understand it. But God, I've done these things that are wrong. I've sinned. I've done these terrible things. And I don't understand why you still bless me. I don't understand why you still do things for me. Why you still give me things. That love, it passes our knowledge. And we don't comprehend it in our mind. But then we start to understand it in our heart that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And all the fullness of God is right here in this book. The fullness of God is right here. We don't have, there's not anything that we're missing. 
There's not as there was this guy on Sid Roth, it's supernatural, who said, oh, I got to go to heaven. And God showed me a room full of books. Books. And it was all these secret things that nobody on earth knew about. And Jesus told me that I could take any of these books back down with me. So I went to this one book and I pulled it out. And Jesus said, uh, accept that book. You can't take that book. That book has things in it that are not ready for the, the world can accept it right now. But I'll tell you what, I'll let you go back down and then I'm going to bring you back up here one day and then I'm going to, you can take that one book then and back down with you because then when I send you back with it, the world will be ready. And it was John chapter 23. There is no John chapter 23. And what that means is there was something else in the gospel that we don't have that God's going to send this guy back down with. Though we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. And of course, everybody that watches Sid Roth, they believe that. They believe those stories. They believe that there's something else that God has not given us yet. It's a lie. It's a lie. Amen. You have it in you. Ephesians 2. Uh, you know, I think I did cover that last week. Ephesians 4. Turn to Ephesians 4. So, you put off, verse 22, you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. You remember the old man, right? Let the old man die. There's a song called that. Let the old man die. That was the former conversation. That's who you used to be. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And that old man has got lust in him. Awful. Awful things. Verse 24, that you put on the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So, I mean, look at what he's saying here. In one verse, he said, the new man is inside of us. But then he also says, the new man has been put on us. And somebody, what was we talking yesterday about clothing, garments. And there's a story in the Old Testament where Jehu, has, he's, he's killed Jezebel. And God has put it in his heart to kill all the Baal worshipers. He said, I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to God sent me to get rid of the Baal worshipers. So he goes to the house of Baal and he pretends then to be this Baal guy. And he says, Who, who's on Baal's side going to glorify and worship Baal? And all these people said, us, us, us. So what they did was they grabbed all of these vestments that they used in Baal's worship. I don't know what they were. But they were clothing that uniquely identified, like a priest garment. I mean, a priest, you can tell a Roman Catholic priest from everybody else, right? So they had these vestments, and everybody that worshipped Baal put these vestments on. And they all came to the temple of Baal. So now, it's easily identified who is and who isn't. You see that? I think that's a prophecy. I think there's something that is going to happen that when it transforms the people of this world, it is going to be easily identified who is and who isn't. Amen? So they, all these Baal worshippers, they put on these Baal vestments. They're all in the temple of Baal. So Jehu goes out and he tells all of his army, this is going to be easy, guys. Easiest thing you've ever done. You're going to go in town... And everybody that's got one of those bail vestments on, slaughter them. And that's exactly what happened. You are not supposed to look like Baal. You were called to be the appearance of Jesus Christ because you have put on Jesus Christ. You wear him. 
He is in you. He is out of you, looking like you. You are, and so, and here's the reason. So that when God looks at you, He sees His only begotten Son. And He says, I will not judge you because you're free, you're righteous. Isn't that neat? That's that new man. We'll put that on. Turn to Colossians. Paul says the same thing in the book of Colossians. Verse th chapter 3, verse 5. This is, man, this is going to get right into the message I'm going to preach this morning. Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members. I, I did touch on this last Sunday, I remember it. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. Inordinate means not ordinary. You are to, you are to have affection for your spouse. That means your husband or wife. But you're not to have affection for anybody else. Whether they are your next door neighbor, a man or a woman across town that you used an app to find. Isn't that something? That nowadays... Back in the old days, if you wanted to find somebody that would sleep with you, it was hard to do. Now you have an app. And I know people who do this. They've used an app, find somebody, and instantaneously know that that person is willing. That's inordinate affection. You're not supposed to be have affection for things or people like that. Somebody say amen. amen. Evil concupiscence, same thing. Covetousness, same thing. Idolatry. See, covetousness is idolatry. You might say, well, I don't have statues of Mary around, but you have covetousness. That's idolatry. For th which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. And to some of you who do not chase after women, you've got a problem with your mouth. When you get mad, it comes out of you. Cursing, swearing, you'll curse things, you'll even curse people. I've heard some parents curse their own children. That's wrong. That is so wicked. Don't curse your children. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. See, it's Christ. We're putting on Christ. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free. But Christ is all and in all. So it's, it's not that he loves the black people only, or it's not that he loves only the Anglo white people. And I have looked into and studied some churches, they call themselves, down in northwest Arkansas, southwest Missouri, areas like that is full of them. The KKK is down there. All the white supremacists are down there. And there are actual churches who are in a compound. And these people are loaded with guns to the hilt. And they actually have in their doctrinal statement, Jesus only saves white Anglo people. We're the real tribes of Israel. Everybody else will die. But there are black Hebrew Israelites who say the exact same thing. We're, because we're black we are the only ones who God loves. Everybody else is the seed of Satan. And so we think they should all be killed. Okay? That's not what he said here. There's neither Greek nor Jew. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. Neither barbarian nor Scythian. Nor Canadian. Nor Mexican. Amen? Amen. Nor uh, European. Nor Brexit British. <laughs> nor any of you. It doesn't matter where you came from. 
Jesus loves them all. Somebody say amen. The new man can be in any one of them. I didn't just hear that. Turn to Romans 6. See, we're kind of off the schedule a little bit. Romans 6, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. This is what I sat down and talked with Tad about the other day. I said, Tad, if I'm going to baptize you, I want to talk, I want to talk you through this. You're going to understand you've already been baptized. And what I'm going to do in that baptistry is just showing everybody on the outside what you are testifying has happened on the inside of you. Therefore, we are buried with... That's why we don't splash them. Here, take that water in your face. Now you're baptized. We don't do that. Bury them. Now, he was a little harder to bury than most other people I've had. Okay? He had some knee problems. That's why I didn't make him go all the way down because I wasn't sure if we could get him back up. But anyway, we buried him nonetheless. When I saw his back wasn't under the water, I did. I went. <laughs> I did. I pushed him. <laughs> All right, now get up. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever had to do it that way. I'm not kidding you. That's why I'd like to baptize them when they're little. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, now, I see, I practiced that before because I've done it to my sister. <laughs> For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Amen. We're going to rise. Amen. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him. And that while ago He said, mortify your deeds. Kill them off. And you know how the best way to kill them? Don't feed them. Best way to kill off your lust? Don't feed them. You all know what that means. Everybody in here knows exactly, in your situation, exactly what that means. Okay? Now, it may take a long time. God is patient with you through this process. You be patient with God through this process. And I promise you, He'll kill it. The old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Amen to that. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. Romans 2. I'm, I'm moving through some of this. I, I, I want to get some of this out. Romans 2, verse 28, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Amen. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. You are the seed of Abraham by faith. You are the Jew, the people of God by faith because Christ the new man, Christ the Jew, the new man, the Israel of God lives inside of you. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter which whose praise is not of men but of God. And so the circumcision really represents getting rid of the flesh. Because that's what they would say, the flesh of the foreskin. You're getting rid of the flesh. And it happens at death. The body must die so the soul can be free from that body of death. Romans 7. Romans 7, I, I, I encourage anyone, I encourage anyone who is, you believe, You've asked Jesus to save you. You've asked God to forgive you. And you still have that thorn in you. And, it's, and you don't like what you're doing. And it you may cause you to say, I'm not saved. The devil will tell you, see what you just did? You're not saved. You're not saved. You're not born again. Saved people don't do that. And if you show up at church that way, you're going to feel guilty. Because nobody in that church is like that. And it's going to tell you that all the time. So the Apostle Paul, the, the greatest Christian ever to live... The greatest evangelist, the greatest church builder, the greatest preacher, the greatest human man to ever live admitted to everybody that he did 
things that he didn't want to do. If then I do, verse 16, that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth, and we covered that yesterday, no good thing. For to will is present with me. And see, that's, that's your will. Now, I talked about this on a, on a PMO here a while back. Because somebody asked the question in Hebrews where it says, If we sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Okay? Your will. If your will is that you never do anything wrong ever again, and you want righteousness and you want heaven, that's what, that's what that word will is here for. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Who's ever run into that? Raise your hand. How to do, how to do that, I don't know how to do. You can try self-help. You can try doctors. You can try medication. You can try whatever. But you'll be like the woman who, after 12 years, she had spent all of her money on the doctors. She went to Jesus. Okay? Jesus does have the cure. It may take a while, it may take years, it may take months, it may take whatever. Just let God, do, if you ask God to do it, He's not turning around and saying, do it yourself. He will do it. I promise He will. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would, see his will? Will is in the word would. When I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members. My eyes, my ears, my mouth, my hands, my feet, my body. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And that is after what he said in the first part of that chapter where he talked about the woman married to that evil man and she's trapped in that as long as he's alive. But when he dies, she's free. And that's what happened to... Who was it um, that David married? Abigail. She was married to the, that wicked man. God killed him. So now she's free. And she took her five damsels with her. You know what that number means? The rapture. The translation. That's when we're leaving our old man and marrying the new one. Amen? I better quit. We got a church service to have. Amen? We'll, we'll continue this next week. I love, I, 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 really, I really think I need to be in as in-depth as possible on this doctrine of the inner man because it really is what a Christian is. It's not outward. It's not, what, it's not this. It's the inward man. It's, it's you after you have failed coming back to the house of God. Amen? After you have failed, you come back to the house of God. You come back to God and say, God, I fell, but I'm back up now. A just man follows seven times. He gets back up. Father, we love you and we thank you for this word. We thank you, dear God, for the grace that you've given us. And Lord, I, I pastor a church of sinners. I pastor a church of people that have failed. I love the people that fail. Because they want to do better. And they want to be better. And I'm not interested in those who already think that they're better. I'm interested in those who want to be better. Who want to be right with you. And they cannot find out how to do it 
except to trust only you. So I pray, dear God, that you would bless each and every one that only trusts you. and They do not trust themselves. That's the people, Lord, I would want to be sitting in, this, in these pews. Pray that you'd bless us now. Bless this hospital. Bless this hospital. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.